All right. Let me go ahead and turn up the desktop audio a little bit there. Okay, well, it looks to me like we had a little bit of trouble with the... Uh, a little bit of trouble with the Twitch stream. Actually getting some of the audio out of the program here, which is funny, since I didn't even touch OBS. All right, hopefully my edited stream information has gone through by now. Yeah, how's everyone doing today? I wanted to go ahead and just launch a little stream while I do some work on memory optimization in Aka.net. So I spent the better part of three hours, maybe four today, uh, trying to troubleshoot an issue for a customer where they were concerned that the amount of our uh, Hocon is the configuration format that Akadata uses. They were worried that the number of Hocon objects piling up in memory for actors that had previously been terminated was excessively high. So I went ahead and I'll uh, pull up my personal GitHub here in just a second. I'll go ahead and grab this. So I actually went ahead and built an entire reproduction sample that I spent a bit of time working on. Let me just uh, open that up. This uh, wildcard deploy leak. And I tested against two different versions of Akka.net and tried to go ahead and reproduce a memory leak here. Now, it turns out that uh, there actually wasn't a memory leak at all. Problem was that the Gen 2 garbage collection process that goes through and reclaims all of that memory that was used by those actors that are now dead, that process wasn't running unless I forced it to uh, with an explicit gc.collect call down here. So... This basically forced the garbage collector to go ahead and run all, all generations, so Gen 0, uh, 1, and 2. And this went ahead and dramatically produced a major drop-off in the memory graph. Uh, in fact, let me go ahead and pull up dot .memory real fast. This is the program I like to use for memory profiling. Um, so this is a little bit different than what we've been doing uh, the past couple of nights, where we've been working, with, uh, we've been working quite a lot with Benchmark.net. Uh, this is a profiler, and what this is useful for in the context of doing, you know, sort of performance analysis is trying to figure out, oh, uh, whoops. Well, okay, I guess we can go ahead and profile this process again. So this is going to spawn in the neighborhood of about 600,000 actors in, I don't know, a few seconds. Those actors will shut themselves down after about three seconds of being alive. That's why you're seeing all these sort of peaks and valleys here. Now I'm going to grab a snapshot. Uh, this will go ahead and give me kind of a point in time representation of all the objects that were alive. Now you'll notice that the heap generations uh, plummeted by quite a bit when I did that. That's because every time you take one of these memory snapshots, it's going to go ahead and force garbage collection. So I'm waiting for this little message to show up. All actors terminated. Now, strictly speaking, that's not necessarily true. Um, the issue might be that uh, some of those actors are still kind of running in the background, but... These little peaks and valleys right here indicate to me that there's a bunch of actors starting and stopping. These graphs tell me that the, while the actor system is still alive and there's still some actors running, this is mostly the, I'm guessing this is probably the scheduler in Aka.net running behind the scenes. So it's iterating over a whole bunch of hash buckets over and over again. And all that work's basically happening in, let's see, Gen 0 and Gen 1. You'll notice that Gen 2 is increasing in memory footprint, but it always gets compacted back down to about 12 megabytes here. So this is basically the steady state for this program. Um, now let me go ahead and grab another snapshot here. We can go ahead and do a little comparison. Um, so let's see. 3.22 megabytes survived. 10.57 uh, megabytes uh, died between snapshot 1 and snapshot 2. And then Snapshot 2 allocated another 10 megabytes. This is probably all memory traffic from the uh, probably all memory traffic from the uh, scheduler running in the background here. Now I can go ahead and take a look at the types of objects that are being allocated, and I want to take a look at the minimum number of retained bytes. Uh, let's see, is this coming from Snapshot 2? Yes, it is. Okay, this is the one I want to look at. So we have a whole bunch of retained bytes. These are probably actors that were killed after my garbage collection call was invoked. So these are probably actors that started kind of late in the process here. So we have about 10 megabytes of retained data. Now if I go and take a look, 
Actually, you know what? Let me go back. The graph I usually like to look at is my dominators. Let's pull this up real quick. This guy gives you an overview of where memory is sitting in any one of these point in time snapshots. So, so far, looks to me like we have a whole bunch of memory sitting in this local actor ref. Take a look at that. Now I can see a bunch of this is those actor path classes that we spent the past uh, couple of streams uh, performance optimizing. So there's only 44 kilobits worth of those laying around. So that's probably nothing to get too excited about. Well, hello, him, Jay. How are you doing? Good to see you. Hmm. Next, I'm gonna take a look here. I have my normal child container that has 8.2 megs of the data in it. Then I have my mailbox. Mailbox is where all the messages are processed. Uh, we know this is actually a fairly heavyweight data structure because it has a concurrent queue and some other things that help synchronize the actor's memory. So the really surprising figure here is this normal children container. That this is where a whole bunch of the data lives. And if we take a look, it's because this is a big, fat, immutable dictionary that gets updated every single time we go ahead and create a new child actor. So this is actually a fairly expensive data structure. And this child restat starts data structure down here is also holding on to a whole bunch of actor references and other stuff behind the scenes. And this is all a byproduct of basically creating this hierarchy of actors. If I take a look at my source code here, let me go ahead and close that out. Uh, if I go ahead and take a look, actually, this is the wrong project. Uh, let's see, get rid of that, get rid of that. This is what I want to look at. So I take a look at this project right here. I basically have in my program.cs, I'm gonna go ahead and create a parent actor. And then every time I message this parent actor, I'm gonna go ahead and spawn a child. Uh, every time one of these children spawns, they're going to go ahead and create a child. This child's going to be a router that has five children of its own. And that's going to be determined by... This is what we we're trying to use to reproduce this memory leak, was this little bit of code here. Uh, next, we're going to use the scheduler to basically set, schedule a message three seconds in the future saying, hey, I want you to go ahead and terminate us uh, in the event that there is no... Um, in the, well, basically, I want you to go ahead and send us a message uh, three seconds in the future. It's going to be a poison pill message, which will cause this actor to shut down. And finally, I have a little worker actor down here. Uh, this worker actor doesn't do anything. So this is a fairly minimalist example. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create my parent actor. And then I'm going to go ahead and tell that parent actor to spawn 100,000 children. And each one of those children is in turn going to go ahead and spawn a pool router uh, well, actually, each one of those children is a pool router. All that itself is going to have five children, too. So that gives us a grand total of 600,000 actors. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and delay. Every 1,000 actors, I'm going to go ahead and add a 100 millisecond delay here. Uh, this is mostly just to kind of spread out some of the work. Uh, that way, I get a longer window of time. I can kind of observe the memory pressure over. That's what that's for. And then those actors will start shutting themselves down three seconds after they boot. And then after a total of 10 seconds, we go ahead and we force garbage collection here. So that's what's going on behind the scenes. What I basically figured out from looking at this, and let me go ahead and close all my tabs so far. And let me go ahead and stop this so we don't keep uh, profiling memory and dot memory here. What I learned here is that this normal children container is rooting a whole bunch of objects. And I think the reason why that's happening is, if I go back to my little sample, let's see, this is my sample here. This parent actor is the one who's spawning all those children. Well, that parent actor is never, um, <laughs> that parent actor is never actually dying. So that object is staying retained in memory for an indefinitely long period of time. So that might constitute a bit of a memory leak, potentially. Uh, the other problem that we have is that the actual data structure we're using is immutable. So imagine this. If I go and pull up, let's see, I want to take a look at actor cell dot children. This is where I believe all this code's defined. Now, the code that we're taking a look at today 
it's all open source. This is from the Aka.net project, uh, which I mention all the time on here. Oh, hey, new follower. Well, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. Um, well, uh, we, I basically mention this all the time because it's what I, I work on full time pretty much. But the gist of it is, is that we're going to go ahead and try to speed up the rate at which actors are spawned. And we're going to try to decrease the memory pressure that we create as a result of changing, of sort of updating these immutable objects constantly. So if I take a look here, we have this interface. Uh, it's internal, so I have the ability to change it without breaking our public APIs. That's nice. And it's called a children container. Do not call me directly. Now, if we go and take a look at this, go to implementation, normal children container. So what's happening, this is from the uh, Microsoft dot, uh, oh, actually, uh, sorry, system.collections.immutable. Uh, this is part of the Microsoft base class library. It's not built directly in to the .NET runtime. You have to install it as a separate NuGet package. Uh, but we use immutable collections everywhere in Aka.net. Uh, immutable collections play nicely in concurrent environments, uh, whereas you know, immutable ones typically do not. So the way this is modeled is that every time I go ahead and add a child, I'm going to go ahead and modify that dictionary. And I'm going to go ahead and let's say set an item inside that immutable dictionary. Every time I remove a child, I'm going to go ahead and remove an item from the dictionary. And when this, when this uh, actor that owns this child container collection is going to die, we go ahead and we shift the entire state to this terminating child uh, children container. And so we also have the ability to make reservations and fun stuff like that. Now, a little bit of context about Aka.net and uh, actors is that it kind of works similar to a process. It's like a big process supervision tree. Uh, actors are organized hierarchically. So anytime you go ahead and make a call, if I go to my code sample down here, anytime you go ahead and make a call to actor system to actor of, you're creating what's called a top level actor. This is an actor that lives pretty much at the top of the actor hierarchy as far as an actual Akadonet developer is concerned. Now, if I scroll down a little bit further, I have the ability to go ahead and call context to actor of. That is, uh, that, what that means in this context is this parent actor is creating a child actor. So one process can basically spawn other processes. And when the parent process dies, all the children processes also get shut down. So the problem that we're having in this case is that this code sample is spawning, you know, 600,000 actors that are all basically descended from a single parent. That parent is rooting a whole bunch of actor references. And it looks to me like part of the problem might be that there's old instances of those immutable dictionaries hanging around. And as a result of that, even though we're you know, removing references to children uh, when they shut down, we're forming this big graph that's fairly expensive to get garbage collected all at once. So a couple of things I'm thinking about doing here. This normal child container is designed, like if I go ahead and show you where it's being used, uh, let's see. We have our little actors leak spec right here. Um, where do we actually use this? Let me take a look at the actor cell. So when we go ahead and add a child, yeah, here we go, attach child right down here. What we're gonna do is, and let's go ahead and step into this method. This is a bunch of safety checking stuff that we don't actually normally run very often. Let's see, let me close that. This allows us to perform deep serialization of actors so we can make sure they're capable of being deployed over the network if you want to. But what we do is we go ahead and we reserve the child's name. We go ahead and we construct the path for this child actor. And then we go ahead and we basically tell the actor system to spawn it. And then that child actor will go ahead and actually be attached back to us is what's going to happen. So we go ahead and we do this. And let's see. A knit child, a replace the reservation with the real actor. And then we start that actor here. This is how we basically go ahead and spawn a child actor process. So I believe when we go ahead and we modify, let me go to this for a second. When we go ahead and we modify this actor, I believe we're performing what's called a compare and swap routine, which is a lock-free way of trying to go ahead and set uh, what's fundamentally a mutable value 
inside a system. In our case, that's the child container collection. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is we try to go ahead and grab a reference to the current child container. We go ahead, swap out the old child actor instance with the new one. And then this is the method where we actually do perform compare and swap right here. We're basically using interlocks.compare exchange. We're taking a reference to the location and memory where this is stored. And we're gonna go ahead and say, hey, look, uh, we want to go ahead and swap out the old children with the new children, but you should only ever do that in the event that the old value is still what it, what it used to be. So we're basically saying, hey, swap this pointer out from looking at this location to this location, but only if that pointer hasn't been changed uh, by the time we start our operation. So this actually uses a fairly low level Intel instruction to do that. So that's why it's considered to be thread safe, but on a multi-core system, it's still possible that this is racy. That's why you need to go ahead and essentially run this comparison over and over again. So that's what's going on with that. So we're basically going and doing a little bit of um, a for loop, uh, a while loop here to go ahead and make sure we perform the compare and swap routine. So this all makes a ton of sense. However, one small caveat. The child container collection does not actually need to be thread safe for 99.9 .9 repeating percent of actors. The reason for that is because most actors run inside their own unique thread context. And therefore, no other operations can actually modify this state while they're executing. So, you know, if a, if a parent actor is creating a child, uh, only the parent actor can do that while it's either processing a message or while it's starting up uh, using its pre-start block. So it's not like someone else can go ahead and spawn an actor for that parent. Only the parent actor can do that. Therefore, we can probably get away with a mutable data structure here, and that should help tremendously with performance. That's one thing we could possibly do. Um, problem is, though, is that the very top level actors, the ones that get started at the beginning of your actor system, they actually are not thread safe because I can go ahead and spawn a ton of them in parallel all at once if I want to. So that's, um, that's something that we can go ahead and do if need be. So the other thing we can take a look at is this data structure itself. Whoops, I think I hit completely the wrong button. Yes, I did. I meant to hit F12, I hit F11. All right, there we go. So this little child stats collection maintains a read-only reference to this child, and it's basically keeping track of how often this actor restarts. Well, the problem that we're having from a routing point of view is basically, let me go and take a look at this. This is some old code we haven't touched in like seven or eight years in the Akadana project. But long story short, this object is creating some roots uh, to this child actor. And I think that's one of the reasons why some of that data is not getting GC'd right away. So I wanna go ahead and see if we can find uh, a window of opportunity here to kind of simplify some of this code and maybe may turn this into a conditional weak reference or something like that. Uh, that's something that we're going to take a look at. Um, so a lot of different things we can do here, all sort of in service ultimately of trying to help reduce the total uh, amount of memory that's being allocated and also the amount of roots that are being retained, which forces everything into uh, GC2 and generally speaking, forces the process to wait quite a while before we do it. All right. Now, the first thing that kind of sucks is even though this is in the internal namespace, uh, these are all public interfaces, probably because users can go ahead and write. Uh, in fact, let me make sure I'm on the right branch. Yeah, go to, all right. Go ahead and fetch awka.net real fast. One thing that kind of sucks about this, because it's a public interface, I do have to worry about uh, making breaking API changes. So that's, that's a little inconvenient, but not the end of the world. Um, let's see, we'll go ahead and do this perf. Uh, we'll call this child container optimization. Okay. Yeah, that was good. Okay. First thing I'm going to go ahead and do is clean up some of these comments. Um, you have any UT for this interface? Uh, what's UT short for? UT. 
Unit tests. Oh, yeah. Um, we have in our... Let me find it. So, Aka.net overall has tens of thousands of unit tests. Whoa, hey, Arjun. Um, no spanification tonight. We're looking at uh, trying to go ahead and, and decrease... Uh, the garbage collection pressure of spawning and killing actors because I noticed while investigating a potential memory leak for a customer that these iChild stats collections were rooting a ton of uh, dead objects. And so it forced these huge garbage collection paws. So um, in terms of our child stats interface, let me see. Da, 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 da. Cancellation. Setup. Scheduler. I think the big ones that we have here for unit testing this. In fact, let me take a look. I can go ahead and work backwards from our references. Let's see. Um, routed actor cell. But we don't use the interface directly in any of those tests, but I know we actually use, let's see, this quite a bit. Let's take a look at it. This is one of the concrete implementations of that type. Okay. Yeah, so we actually have a unit test for this. That's a benchmark, though. Uh, the ch children container spec. Then we have death watch spec, which uses this. Um, where else? We have an actor's leak spec, which is the one that I really care about. That basically makes sure that if any change I make doesn't accidentally result in stuff being floated out into space. So I think the first approach we should take a look at. Let's take a look at this. This all looks okay. Don't see a huge amount of... I don't see a huge amount we can do directly with iChild stats. The only thing that might be worth doing, um, let's see. The only thing that might be worth doing, I'm tempted to change this to a struct uh, and see what happens there, but that's actually not the least of my problems. It's really the container up here that's a bit of an issue. Okay. So let's take a look at where we're using this. Init child, children container, and what type is this? Swap children refs. Hmm. So basically, we're kind of uh, optimized for a case that doesn't affect most actors. We're optimized for a case where... Basically, uh, you're, we're externally attaching actors to like uh, the user, the root actor, but most internal actors don't need to operate that way. Set terminated, interlock.exchange. That is fine. Yeah, let's see what else. Is waiting for children. Well, I can go ahead and clean that up at least. Suspend children. Set terminated. That should be fine. Interlock.exchange. Set child termination reason. Well, true. If terminating children container. Oh, thank you. Can't we make actor ref in the stat simulation weekly held or something? All right, so that's a good point. Um, actually, that's the sec second suggestion I've had today. Let me go ahead and pull up. Let's see. Uh, C sharp. I don't like Googling on screen here, so I'm doing it off screen. Weak reference. All right, let's take a look at that. All right. Represents a weak reference, which references an object while still allowing that object to be reclaimed by garbage collection. So, what we don't want to have happen is we don't want the weak reference that we have to actually get garbage collected. Because that now we lose the ability to actually keep track of our children. So, we have to go ahead and make sure that 
if we do want to change this to weak reference, it only has to be when we don't need access to it anymore. So that's what this is. Um, there's another type. I think it's conditional weak table. I think. Yeah, here we go. Conditional weak table. Enables compilers to dynamically attach uh, fields to manage objects. Well, that's not what we want. So I think weak reference is what we're going for. Um, See, so yeah, I'm a little hesitant about doing this. The What I'd like to try to do is actually, if I can go ahead and give it a try. So this is going to be bad of me, but I'm going to go ahead and make it happen anyway. Is this type sealed? Normal children container? Okay, no, it's not. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and subclass non, you know, root normal children. Up, oh, gotta declare it as a class. Let's see. It's not containing the structure with zero arguments. Ah, you know what? I can't do it that way. Damn. Uh, the whole reason why I can't do it that way is because it takes an immutable dictionary. And does the base take this as well? Yes, it does. Oh, gosh. Well, this is the whole thing we're trying to avoid. Uh, we're trying to avoid lazy read-only collection. I remember this. This was something we had to do, I believe, uh, because we someone called to list somewhere around here, and it caused the entire application to explode, if I recall correctly. So this like lazily evaluated. What's going on in the stream? Okay. Let me give this a shot. All right, children container. Yeah, you remember that, Arjun? That was some bad stuff. Yeah, this is this like I, I mentioned at the beginning of the stream. This is like ancient code in the context of Akka.net. Um, let's go and pull this up. Is normal? Is terminating? Let's get rid of that. So we just need a private field for children. Child restart stats. Values of type. And let me take a look at this. Private class, lazy read only collection. What exactly was lazy about this? This doesn't seem lazy at all. I don't understand what's actually going on in here. I guess it's just that it returns a collection that gets evaluated later this kind of sucks <laughs> this class okay uh gogusan out of context question i'm a dotnet developer uh working for almost two years now at the dotnet stack half a year ago i started digging into performance specific c-sharp gotchas I started looking at alternate languages do you have an opinion on going is it worth learning and using while I am fluent with the .NET stack at the moment? Um, I think you meant Golang. Okay, gotcha. I'm also learning Rust, but I am still thinking about Golang, and I'm stuck with this. So it's very easy to go ahead and performance optimize .NET these, these days, but being an older platform, you know, it's been around since uh, 
in some way, shape, or form since 2001, although they kind of reimagined a lot of the internals with .NET Core uh, over the past couple of years, .NET is, is very capable of being performance optimized. That being said, newer languages and runtimes like Rust and Go are able to learn from a lot of the mistakes uh, that developers working on platforms like Java and C Sharp made. Um, here's my take. Your tool belt as a developer should fit any number of different uh, programming languages in it because you can learn good ideas from any of them. You know, I personally spend 90% uh, of my time doing C Sharp, but I al I've also done a fair amount of F Sharp. I've done uh, a lot of, I spend a lot of time reading Scala in particular, which is where the original Aka framework is written in. Uh, I also spend quite a bit of time, you know, troubleshooting JavaScript and occasionally things like, you know, Python <laughs> uh, types of issues. So I, I've got access to multiple programming languages. I probably couldn't build a production application in anything other than C Sharp right now, um, just because I, I haven't built up that muscle memory. I think it'd be a great idea to go ahead and learn Rust or Golang. Um, in terms of job opportunities, I think .NET and Java are still probably where it's at. That's just where most of the most of the business in this space is. So I think you're you're very well served by staying in that market. But there's also a lot of powerful open source tools like Docker and Kubernetes that are all implemented in Go. Uh, Rust is becoming quite popular for building high performance software. Um, so there's a lot of people who are starting to learn how to write things like IoT systems. Uh, I think I saw like people writing multiplexers for game servers and things like that using it the other day. So there's a lot going on. Um, I think you could benefit from learning any language. Um, so I would say, you know, it's probably a good idea to invest in .NET as a way to um, sustain employment opportunities. But I think in terms of uh, learning new things and new paradigms and becoming a stronger programmer overall... I think learning Go or uh, Rust would be fantastic. I've never had a chance to work with either. I've uh, just been too busy. Um, but I would. Uh, I, I think Rust in particular is really interesting. Um, you know, part of my part of my issue is uh, my my day job uh, involves supporting .NET developers, so that's what I spend the bulk of my time doing. So your mileage may vary, but I think that'd be. Um, I think you'd be very well served by that. So, Gogasan, I hope I answered your question there. Good. Glad you glad you appreciate it. Um, okay. Now, where was I? Child stats appender key value pair. Child restart stats. Oof. And what do we use this for? Just when we're doing a uh, string. Okay. No problem. That's not a big. That's not a big deal. All right. Let's go back to taking a look at our child container here first thing i'm gonna do i'm gonna go ahead and create private read only i dictionary string for the child's name and then this should be i child stat go ahead and call this active stats take that in now yeah, that lazy read-only collection thing, I'm going to have to take another look at that because maybe that's a place we can get some performance optimization. But that seems pretty pretty effed up to me. Um, okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Well, I guess I need to go ahead and validate this change. You know what? Nah, no, I don't. I'm going to be bad. Let's see. There's no given argument. Yeah, take that, resharper. Yeah, I remember Jeff. Jeff was a smart guy, so I'm not going to doubt it, but I think it is weird code. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Good idea. This is back before we required people to comment on these reviews, right? All right, let's take a look at the pull request. Man, thank God we have all this history here.
Yep, I remember this. This performance issue. Let's see, and we benchmarked it all here. Man, Aka.net 1.07. Good lord. What a blast from the past. And here's and here's me bitching about systems.collections that immutable uh back even back then. I suspect part of the problem that we had back then was we had some like little hacky data structures that weren't using system.collections that immutable. Yeah. Yeah, if we take a look at the per, per, the original commit here. So this goes and counts over the entire collection. And then down here, we take the I enumerable. We're basically delaying, if I'm not mistaken. Oh God, yeah, I remember this. This was the thing that was causing such a huge performance hit. Was this old link query that we had right here. Like we don't even have any code at all in Aka.net that uses like this link syntax. You know, we'll, we'll go ahead and call the extension methods directly, but oh man. And it's because we were doing, yeah, a full evaluation of this every single time. So that makes sense why Jeff did that was we wanted to go ahead and defer evaluation of this because we don't need to actually do it all the time. So yeah, not that is definitely not obvious. You're, you're correct about that. Um, you know, if I really wanted to be a, a total bastard here, maybe I could just turn this into a span. I don't know. Um, probably, probably not a great idea either, but yeah, that makes sense. All right, well, I'm going to steal this, and we're going to definitely use that again. <laughs> um, if it worked, if it, if it worked in 2016, I'm sure it still works now. So we'll go ahead and grab that. Now, the big thing I want to do is just try making this mutable, but I have to find a way to differentiate based on the actor that we're inside of whether this is a safe context or an unsafe one. Uh, let's see. So this old code, you know, what? I'm going to do dual window here. About time I use some of these Visual Studio features. All right. Let's see. This is my... That's the abstract implementation. Oh, and of course the... Yeah, let me move this to its own file. All right. Of course, like the file I'm trying to read from and the file I'm modifying are the same one. It's always how it works out. Okay. Internal children dot remove child dot path dot name. Okay. Well, I think I can do that. Dot remove child dot path. Try and get by name. All right. Let's see. Return. And then I guess I need to go ahead and just pass in whatever this environment variable name is. That's. Yeah, there we go. Try and get by ref. All right. Guess what? Uh, let's see name of this property here you know what this is annoying me <laughs> i'm gonna go back to doing this okay there we go all right actor at name out stats all right there we go got a little bit of dry principle going on there children all right well guess what if I go to normal children container. Where's my lazy enumerator? Uh, 
Is it under children container base? All right. I got Godzilla destroying uh, code bases on one screen and uh, destroying code bases on another. Dude, yeah. My primary job as the you know, maintainer of Vaka.net here is basically just like figuring out which code I need to delete at any given time. Delete deleting code is my number one value add. In fact, I think if I take a look at the commit graph for Vaka.net, I think I've actually deleted more code than I've ever contributed. If we go to insights, let's take a look at this. Yeah, if we go to contributors. Yeah, get a load of this. I've contributed 216,000 lines, deleted 219,000. I'm just destroy, destroying code every chance I get. You've got people on our team like Bartosz, who's contributed about the same amount of code I have, but he's deleted only a, a small amount. Whereas uh, I'm pretty happy with my roles as Terminator in chief of Aka.net source code there. All right. Okay, where was I? Non-root normal container, that's right. All right. Uh, now let me just make sure I didn't break anything. Ew. Well, that was not quite as simple as I hoped it would be. All right. That's fair, I guess. How do we do this in our old container? Let's see. Shadow container base. Try and get by name. If internal, try get value. Try get by name, or try get by actor ref. Use pattern matching, bro. All right, well, let's steal that. Okay. You just delete it should be my PR message. Damn right. Hmm. There we go. Out for stats. Oh, okay, child restart stats is what I'm going for. I got you. All right. And actor equals your stats dot child. Since the actor exists, child restart stats is the only valid child stats. I don't know how I feel about needing to have this here, but I'll let it go. Uh, children. All right, time to steal this again. Yeah, buddy, give me that lazily evaluated link query. That's what I want. All right. Now, not totally safe. Actually, you know what? I should not do this. Um, let me think about it. Not totally safe to do this because this collection is actually mutable. So that could be a bit of a problem. Could be a problem. Right, well, how often does this get called? Actor cell return child container dot children. All right, get children. And when do you get called? Seven references. Mm-hmm. Local actor ref. Well, I don't really know how often that gets called. 
But this might potentially be one of the problems that we have. Actually, you know what? Um, Arjun, your idea about using a weak reference, I think I may have just found a good use case for it. Let's see how terrible of an idea it is. All right. Let's go ahead and go back to our normal children container. Actually, no, I need to go children container base. All right, let's find my little lazy evaluator here. Basically, there's a bunch of these enumerators hanging around that never get used. I want these to die. Here we go. Oh, 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 oh. oh my goodness. Oh, this could be a terrible idea. Jeez. Um, oh, no. <laughs> um yikes okay this could be a terrible idea yep let's give that a shot this will cause something to explode and catch fire That way we're not rooting up all the old instances of this stuff. But I strongly suspect... You know what I'm going to do, actually? I'm going to go back to Aka.net. I'm going to make a commit here. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and leave that out. That is actually fine. Um, no, I actually don't need to make that change. So let me get rid of that. All right. Starting work on non immutable file container collection. Actually, there's a better word for this. It's just called mutable. English makes it too easy to invent new words. All right, go ahead and fill that in. The origin, I get the uh, the sense this is a terrible idea. All right. Well, I guess we can always revert this later. Get a numerator. Okay. Return. Numerator. There we go. Go ahead and do that. Okay. I am scared about what's going to happen here, but let's find out. So, I think probably the best way to go ahead and measure this... Let me go ahead and try measuring the actual actor spawn benchmark. See if that makes any difference at all. Oh yeah, this pro this Aka.net lives and dies by the strength of its test suite. Uh, without it, we would be we would be screwed. Last night on the stream, I managed to completely blow up our. Um, in fact, actually, it's still blown.